Wow, these are some amazing additions to our History of Minor League Hockey collection. Where did you find them all? North of the border, my friend. Where else could you find VHS beauties like this? No way. You actually went into enemy territory? That's right. Three full blocks into Discount Video's jurisdiction. So brave. Welcome to Rewind Video. I'm Bob. I'm Rob. And we love movies. Good ones, bad ones, old ones, new ones, domestic films, foreign films. Rob, gotta come clean with you. Finally. (laughs) I've been taking some time off lately. Unexpected PTO from the store, you've probably noticed. I haven't. Uh We don't do a whole lot around here. (laughs) Well, had you noticed, I imagine you would have thought, hey, maybe you need some me time, some self-care. The truth is, management has me scouting Europe for our next store. Wow. Yeah, did you know that? That is big news. Yeah, it is. We've obviously cornered the market stateside. It's time to shift our attention abroad, so we're going international. I've gotten some stamps in my passport. I have some ideas. One of those ideas is a theme for our staff recommendation shelf. By now, our listeners are surely aware that you and I are in charge of stocking the shelf with movies that deserve our customers' attention. Each time we rotate in new movies, we adhere to a theme. And this week's theme is international travel. Get your traveler's checks. (laughs) That's the only thing you need to pack. Do they still exist? I I, got to believe. I mean, I don't know how else you pay for things. (laughs) In other countries. (laughs) Travelers what? (laughs) Weren't there commercials for Travelers Checks when we were young? Like they advertised advertised them on TV. Yeah, yeah, that was like a thing you were supposed to do if you were traveling. I guess you couldn't take money. (laughs) I never understood it because I I never got it. Yeah, no, neither neither did I. Well, we've obviously got a foreign film section at the store, as any good video store should. But this isn't about foreign films. Uh, today we're going to talk about films where characters travel from one country to the other. Yes, that is the definition of international, international travel. travel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so inherent to this theme is cultural transition, When you say? It's kind of what this is about, or at least, yeah. you know, one place to another, that, that, that place being somewhere very different from where you started. Yeah, travel is like that in general but yeah international travel is a whole nother level oh yeah absolutely yeah and you know it's not something it's not something i've done enough of but hopefully in the future i'll do more yeah yeah well i feel like a theme such as this is a great way to prepare yourself for (laughs) what's to come i that is what a lot of customers do is they listen to our show to prepare themselves for later in life (laughs) right yes and if you tune in tonight you'll learn a lot about why you need to brace yourself for some submarine adventures maybe (laughs) some uh brief encounters with hitmen Mm -hmm. uh some yeah there's a lot in store a lot goes on when you when you travel to different countries yeah america's boring once you cross a border (laughs) forget it (laughs) things get wild well, I'm I'm excited. I, I think that we've explored international travel in some interesting and different ways. I will admit, two of my movies have have some common ground. There's a there's mm. there's a theme of hitmen doing things in other countries, oh. uh, but the the movies themselves are pretty different from one another. I think. I have a common theme in two of my movies, although they're very, very different movies. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. All right. Well, we're we're doing similar things. Yeah. So uh, why don't you why don't you get us started so we can explore common ground, different ground. Yeah, let's see yeah. what kind of ground we're on, and then we'll go to a different different ground, international ground, and then yeah, change the the nation. I'm going to start us in 1990 with the Hunt for Red October. Mm. Not our first submarine movie. No. No, it's not our first submarine movie with uh, a, a red red name in it. Mm. Crimson Tide was on the list before. That's right. Uh, this is kept in our sweater hall of fame. <laughs> uh, if you recall the sweater worn by Alec Baldwin when he's introduced in this movie, it is like an A plus 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 turtleneck sweater that like you dream of. It's an S tier sweater. Yeah, yeah, I, it's, it's uh, impressive sweater work. Yeah, it brought a tear to my eye. Here's the back of the box. 
A new technologically superior Soviet sub, the Red October, is headed for the U.S. coast under the command of Captain Marco Ramius. The American government thinks Ramius is planning to attack. A lone CIA analyst has a different idea. He thinks Ramius is planning to defect, but he only has a few hours to find him and prove it because the entire Russian naval and air commands are trying to find him too. Stakes are high. The stakes are very high. <laughs> this is a Cold War movie. Yes. Very high stakes. Tagline, invisible, silent, stolen. Good tagline. Yeah, that is a good tagline. Yeah. If you're going to go three words, that, that third word needs to be unexpected. It needs to be unexpected, but also like it needs to hit hard. Oh, yeah. You know, it can't just be like, eh, they got me. This one does. Yeah. This is based on a book by Tom Clancy. This is uh, pretty much what launched his career. Really? I yeah. didn't know it was early in his... I think he was like an insurance salesman. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like I got a submarine real. story to yeah. tell. <laughs> and he wrote this book and it, it was published by like a local publisher in like his hometown or something. Wow. It was like the Naval College Publishing Company or something. And uh, yeah, it just like it just became this huge hit and it spawned, I mean, dozens and dozens of books. I mean, Jack Ryan is still having books written about him. And shows made about him. Yeah, Tom Movies, Clancy's shows, been dead for yeah. 10 years and he's still putting out books. So... <laughs> Uh, it's kind of impressive. Um, I think this movie definitely benefited from having like a still kind of an upstart Alec Baldwin. Oh, yeah. Uh, because once this movie became a hit, they brought in Harrison Ford. And like once he took over the role, he was like a huge star. And you, you need something different from the main character at that point. And so Jack Ryan became like this big hero. Uh -huh. um, that also might have been a book thing, too. I've read some of the later books, but I know that in Red October, like, Jack Ryan's kind of a – he's just one of a lot of characters. Interesting. Yeah, like the story that. kind of revolves around what he's doing. But like as far as like how much he's in the book, it's not really that much more than anybody else. Hmm. So he kind of just became the hero of the Tom Clancy universe. This is also kind of a thinking man's action movie. Yes. Because uh, like Jack Ryan, like he's not a front lines guy. He reads books and writes reports for the CIA. Um, so, like, in other words, he's just a nerd. Yeah. You know? Um, and there's really not a lot of pure action in this. There's a lot of submarines. Um, there's the cool uh, helicopter thing where the guy's dropping down. But uh, most of, like, the action is guys, like, leaning one way or the other on a submarine. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> I mean, I, I get characterizing this as an action movie. But at the same time, the lower stakes action than we're used to from, like, the Fast and the Furious franchise. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say lower stakes. Like, a lot of it involves, like, missiles coming at them right. or subs on a collision course. But uh, it, it's more like a tense chess match than it is a pure, like, action set piece. It's like a slow and stealthy uh, 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 opposite the Fast and the Furious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they didn't call it that, I think, wisely. <laughs> right. um, the nerds are the heroes of this movie. Yeah. Um, and it's not just Jack Ryan. There's Jones, the sonar guy. Yeah. Who, uh, who's a total nerd, and he detects the undetectable submarine. Yeah. There's nerds in Crimson Tide, too. I mean, like, remember the yeah. the radio guy, the kid with all the aquariums? Mm. and Yeah, I mean, he was a nerd. I mean, there's a bunch of— And there was comic book talk. Do you think it's, like, inherent to submarines? Do you think that's where they put the nerds? The nerds? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> like, <laughs> the cool guys yeah. go up top? Yeah, you're not you're not ready for planes. Well, I guess nerds are just up. are used to being indoors anyway. That's so true. Whatever. <laughs> um, when I rewatching this, it made me realize that I think this movie probably had as much— as anything else, um, had as much had as much to do with my understanding of Russia and USSR as any anything else I learned in school. Oh, 100 percent. Like this in Rocky Four, I think. <laughs> like that's how I understood yes. the Cold War. Yes, yes. Um, and also, like I don't care that Sean Connery is Scottish. He is like a thousand percent perfect in this part. Absolutely, he's the right man for this role, and I I love that. I mean, they, they do that thing where they transition the accents mm -hmm. from, oh. or the 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 language from, which is still a great idea. Like all these years is. later, it's it's beautifully done. It's great, yeah. And and Sean Connery's not even uh, interested in hiding his his Scottish accent. It's just yeah. like this. <laughs> I mean, as far as I knew when I first saw this movie, that was a Russian accent. Like, I, how would I know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, he'll always be the like the archetype of the Russian submarine captain. Yeah. Uh, when I found out that like they didn't all have beards like that, I was like, "What? Like that doesn't make sense." No. Uh, and also made me realize that the Russians have better songs than we do. 
They oh, just they do. do. They do. Like the national anthem is a, it's a it's a great song. It feels like they've got a lot of songs that they sing in unison, like together. It's like you know, like songs where you put your arm around the man next to you and yeah. and you, you, you sing. You've always known this, the lyrics <laughs> of the song. Yeah. So the international travel in this movie is defection, which is you know I would have to say is probably the most fraught of international travel. Yeah. You know, there's there's at least one side trying to keep you from doing it. Yes. Uh, maybe sometimes two sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there needs to be some back dealing, and especially when you're dealing with a giant submarine. It's dangerous for you. It's dangerous for your family. Um, it could start a world war. It could. <laughs> especially in this situation. So, like, there's a lot going on here. Um, and, and Ramius is going from – the United or from the, U, the USSR to the United States, but also like if you're a submarine captain, you are doing international travel constantly. Oh yeah, without even having to like tell anybody about you it. You spend a lot of time in international waters. Yeah, where well, you can like dip in in over here and over there. Like yes. who's going to stop you? Absolutely yeah. nobody. So there's a there's a, a lot of international travel in this movie, not just by Ramius, but by everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, this this is a a five star classic. Um, 100%. It's it's comfort food, but it's still very substantial. Yes. Um, so like, and plus, it's just you, a movie you can put on at any time, start at any point, watch to the end. It's just it's amazing. Seven um, percent of Letterbox users agree with me that it's oh, a five star movie. Okay. Um, it is uh, overall three point seven. It's rated. Um, That's low. That is low. That's I, low. I, it is low. I think maybe it gets kind of thought of as as kind of just like a generic '90s action thing. I don't really know why that's so low. I would expect it to be closer to four or higher. <sighs> Man, yeah, I I don't know that Connery is getting enough credit because if if memory serves, he went from Last Crusade, Indiana Jones and Last mm. Crusade, to this. And very different roles. Yeah. But both, he he kills it. He kills yeah. it in each. I mean, they're both five star bangers. <laughs> yes, uh, they one are. Of the, one of the letterbox users that, uh, that agrees with me is Casey Malone. And he wrote in his five star review Our dads didn't know how to talk about their feelings, but they knew how to make a hell of a submarine movie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, couldn't agree more. So I'm adding it to the staff recommendation shelf this week under the topic of international travel. Well, I, I love this. This movie's phenomenal. How it's can, great. You, yeah. you, how can you not love and, the, and the, the the run that McTiernan was on at this point too. Oh, is fuck yeah! Ridiculous. So I gotta ask an important question. Yeah, you've brought two submarine movies to the shelf, mm-hmm. <laughs> and if you can only choose one, which is it? Crimson Tide or Hunt for Red October? That is. Really tough. I, I know. don't know if I can answer it. I, I mean, I'd have to just like flip a coin, I think. Oh, man. I think, you know, I think maybe I would take Red October just because like it's been in my life for longer. And I don't know, maybe it's just a, a story that uh, I don't know. I can go back to the book. and I don't know. It's a tough one. It's a tough one. I choose Red October because the stakes for me are higher. You yeah. Double the submarines. And it's not just about what's going on above the water, but also below the water. And yeah, it's it, there. There's conflict on the boat mm-hmm. as well as out in the world and on the other boat. Yeah. There's, We're there's talking about two on. perfect movies. So I mean, like, what are, <laughs> yes, <laughs> what, are. what hair are we splitting? We are. We are. I I do feel like we've eliminated. For ourselves, the opportunity to do a sweater theme because it's <laughs> it's been already conquered by yeah. by Hunt for October. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to look look into that sweater Hall of Fame. Though, so <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, I always forget what's in there. Yeah. Well, fine, fine choice. Uh, I uh, yeah, love that movie. As I said, I'm gonna go onto the land. And my first pick is from 2008, and my movie is In Bruges. I'll give you the back of the box. Ray and Ken, two hitmen, are in Bruges, Belgium, waiting for their next mission. While they are there, they have time to think and discuss their previous assignment. When the mission is revealed to Ken, it is not what he expected. Tagline here, shoot first, sightsee later. (laughs) Which, yeah. yeah, fine. Yeah, it's cute. Pretty good. Yeah, yeah. But makes, not in like a bad way. Makes me smile. Uh, so the international traveling that we get here is England to Belgium. Uh, now, these two hitmen have arrived presumably from somewhere. Uh, they both seem Irish. 
But yeah. Uh, but yeah, who knows where they were before this? But the movie begins with them kind of landing or arriving in Be- in in Belgium. Uh, so as as I mentioned, this is the first of two international travel movies that I have related to hitmen and their international exploits. Two different movies, both revolving around hitmen. This one comes by way of Martin McDonough, director of last year's acclaimed Banshees of Inishirin. I didn't see that. Very uh, good. Uh, yeah, I, I great donkey. <laughs> great. Yeah, yeah. It came up came up on our animals theme. Yeah, um, that movie incidentally stars the same two guys who are in this one: Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson. Different roles, obviously. Similar uh, vibe, though. But yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, not exactly, but it's like a similar similar tonal tonal vibe. Interesting. Yeah. I really like Brendan Gleeson anytime he shows up in something. But Colin Farrell is also good here. In Bruges also gives us a pretty captivating Rafe Fiennes, who uh, plays the short-tempered boss of the two hitmen. Fiennes is never not great. Okay. So. so I remember seeing this in college when my girlfriend at the time had spent some time in Bruges, and she described it as the highlight of all of her time in Europe. And uh, this film actually suggests something similar. You know, it, 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 it proposes that Bruges is this magical fairy tale like place. And unsurprisingly, the film is shot on location here, and you get to take a little bit of that in. I would like to visit Bruges. I, it looks phenomenal. Yeah, it looks great. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, um, Bruges is our, is our setting. We learn halfway through the film that the two hitmen have been sent to Belgium because one of them is being asked to kill the other one. And the boss who gave the orders felt that Bruges, or at least a vis- visit to Bruges, would be a great final memory for the hitman who's about to be killed. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a funny concept. It is. <laughs> Give them something special. Uh, it also shows you how much mindset uh, is uh, important for when you're traveling. You know, because when Colin Farrell gets there, he's like – he's in such a shitty mood. It doesn't matter where you are. He, he's no. just like, the fuck this place. I hate it. It sucks. Yeah, yeah. And he's not one who would appreciate Bruges to begin with, but um, – yeah, I think his, his his he's not ready for this yeah. uh, this, this <laughs> no. stop. So why did I choose this? I think what's great about In Bruges is that it understands that part of visiting another country is the tourism component. And so often when we watch movies that have characters traveling from one country to the next as part of their job or part of the story, the notion of seeing in this and, and visiting the place that they're in is never really acknowledged. And maybe it's that we're supposed to believe these characters don't have any curiosity about where they're at or yeah. um, maybe that, you know, there's not time for that type of storytelling alongside whatever the narrative is. But uh, here, these guys are actually taking in the sights. We, you know, the first act of the movie is like the two of them as tourists in are, Bruges. Are you a sightseer? I am a sightseer, but not in the traditional sense. I'm not interested in points of interest, so to speak. Uh, yeah. Like if I were visiting New York, I wouldn't – and it was my first time. I wouldn't want to go to like Times Square. Right. But uh, but yeah, a place like Bruges, I'd probably want to see some of the notable things, but but also live like the locals do. That's That's yeah. my goal. Yeah, like when they're on the boat going like, oh, look, at this is a, an old church or something, and they're pointing at buildings and stuff. I'm like, that's not me. Yeah. You you probably lean more toward Colin Farrell's character in this. Yeah, he's like, let's go to the Gleason. pub. I'm like, yeah, yeah that, like yeah. That, let's sounds, go to the pub. that sounds fun. If we're in Belgium, let's, travel. let's go to the pub. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, Although so, drive, like going around on a boat and stuff sounds cool too, but like, I don't know, make it sound more fun than be like, we're going to look at these buildings. Yeah, maybe if the boat is going to a pub. Yeah, or like you're drinking on the boat. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So this is uh, this is more of a character study, and uh, the hitmen played by Gleason and Farrell couldn't be more different. Makes their dynamic and Bruges pretty entertaining, as we as we just somewhat discussed. Uh, it's often funny. Not all of the humor has aged well, but it, a lot of it is still entertaining. While this movie is funny, it's also pretty heart wrenching at times, and there's yeah. some there's some big emotional swings here, which I think McDonough pulls off. You know, yeah. it's it's. I hadn't seen it since about the time it came out, and I actually like I actually remembered it as more of a comedy. Likewise, 
I also hadn't seen it in more than a decade. And I don't know that it – I don't know that I saw it at the right time or it, – it, yeah. This rewatch – Definitely changed my opinion of the movie. And it it's funny, but it's called wisdom. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. We're going to video store long enough. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely hit different this time. Um, so, yeah, I like I said, I wasn't sure if I liked it the first time, but um, I, I, I've definitely landed on the fact that this is a, a pretty remarkable film. And it also has me feeling uh, – most certainly, like I want to, I want to visit Bruges. Critics were pretty fond of this. It averages an eighty-four percent on Rotten Tomatoes, four point one on Letterboxd. That's about right. I gave it four stars, which thirty-six percent of Letterboxd reviewers agree with me. Wow. Roger Ebert also gave it four stars. His scale is a little bit different, but he said this film debut by the theater writer and director Martin McDonough is an endlessly surprising, very dark human comedy with a plot that cannot be foreseen but only relished. So um, one review that made me chuckle on Letterboxd, also a four-star review, uh, mentions the the subject of international travel, and this comes from Megan Mitchell. She said, this is like the exact opposite of Before Sunrise. (laughs) (laughs) Hard to disagree. Yeah. So I'm throwing this on the shelf as my first pick for international travel. I'd say give it a shot, especially if you've seen or are aware of Banshees of Inishirin. Yeah. I um I would say just based on this movie, I think I think Bruges should be at the top of the list for European locations of rewind video. Just throwing it out there. Okay. Noted. I would love to go there on a consulting trip. Love it. I, let, let management know. Why not? Maybe maybe we have a a, a store that uh, occupies a boat. Maybe maybe there's you know. Uh, uh, I don't think I want to do. No, that. you don't want to. Yeah, do that? I don't okay. want to like work on a boat. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, well, I will. We'll I didn't mean, I mean to burst your bubble there. No, that's all right. I'd rather right. not work on a boat. It seems like Bruges has a lot to offer. <laughs> so there's probably some other locations. <laughs> all right. I'm going to bring us up to what is now last year. That happened quick. Yeah. 2023. I'm picking the Pope's Exorcist. Oh, I'm so glad you did. <laughs> this is filed under Satan Abroad. <laughs> Back of the box. Father Gabriel Amorth, chief exorcist of the Vatican, investigates a young boy's terrifying possession and ends up uncovering a centuries-old conspiracy the Vatican has desperately tried to keep hidden. Tagline. Possession was only the beginning. Bad tagline. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, yeah, whatever. It's it's very blah. But it's also like, hey, it's an exorcism movie. What do you want? Well, I, that's that's what I thought going into this. I was like, well, this is an exorcism movie. Yeah. What am I going to get? And I got something a lot better than just an exorcism <laughs> movie. So I have the same high bar set yeah. for the tagline, and it did not, did not reach that bar. Fair point. Fair point. So Father Amorth was a real person. Really? Uh, yeah, you didn't know that. No. Yeah, he's a real, real was a real person. Oh um, boy, this is a quote unquote true story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's based on a couple of books he wrote about his experience as being the Pope's exorcist, <laughs> oh, um, played by Russell Crowe. Uh, so this this guy, this exorcist, claims to have done. The, people kept asking him how many exorcisms he had done for the Pope or, like, as the Pope's exorcist. And, like, his number kept getting higher. So, like, the first time people, people asked him, he was, like, tens of thousands, like, you know, 50,000. Then it was, like, 70. Then it was, like, eventually he claimed he had done up to 130,000 exorcisms. And they were, like, everyone's, like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, how is that even possible? And then he's, how he counts them is really is really iffy. Because he's like, well, every time I do a prayer, that counts, you know, like every time, like every time I yell a prayer at the person. So he's like, sometimes it takes like hundreds or thousands of exorcisms just to like exercise one person. Right. So um, and, and, and a possessed person might be possessed by hundreds or thousands of demons, apparently. So it seemed like the number kept going up. But eventually he admitted it was like 94 actual people who had been possessed. That he had exercised. How many? 94? 94. 94. Okay. Uh, so in, some of those included thousands of demons. <laughs> 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 so this guy was kind of like the king of exorcisms. <laughs> um, Wonderful. So like I, I, I don't know exactly how you feel about it. I would say like overall this movie isn't great at 
anything, you know? It's not a gr- it's not great, but I would say it's like really good at exactly what it's trying to do. I would say it's better than really good at doing what it's yeah. trying to do. I think that it is excellent at doing what it's trying to do. I accept that. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a trashy movie, but it's yeah. fucking entertaining oh, as hell. For sure. It's pulpy, it's dark, it's like it's almost campy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you have like Russell Crowe who's just speaking in Italian, <laughs> speaking Ish. with the, with a thick Italian accent, yeah, and, like yeah, yeah. screaming at the devil yeah. for a hundred minutes, and that's over. <laughs> and like I don't know if those are good accents or what, like probably not. No. Whatever. Um, Russell Crowe got a free vacation to Italy out of it, you know. Yeah. Um, he has to wear cool robes. Rides a scooter. Rides a scooter. <laughs> sunglasses. Got a great hat. Um, it's a Lambretta scooter. It's, it's not a Vespa. Okay. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. I'm sure that was a deliberate choice, but I mean I guess that is the scooter he would have been using maybe or did use. Yeah. I mean it's a it's a an actual scooter, you know, that 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 exists. So I, I can't imagine they chose it for a reason because it's a, this is a true story. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> Accuracy is paramount. <laughs> so yeah, so this is just like a perfect programmer. It's like a Friday night, we've got some drinks and some friends over. There's a movie star in it. It's got horror stuff. It's got Satan stuff. It's, there's blood. It, it, it's a gets the job done movie every time. Um, this movie being about exorcism, of course, there's a possessed child, which uh, obvious trope. It's always there. Yeah. It made me ask the question. Um, so if Satan or if, if a demon has possessed this kid. Or in this movie, or any exor- exorcism movie, why is the, why are they just laying in bed all the time? Oh yeah, because not... like the mom's like you got to lay in bed, and like Satan's like okay, <laughs> 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 like why is the like doesn't he have some devil shit to do? Yeah, yeah, get into some hijinks around the house. Yeah, it makes it makes you wonder. Yeah, uh, but also I really appreciate how the Catholic Church is becoming this uh, kind of a perfect shadowy organization in these like supernatural uh horrors horror slash like exorcism movies or even other movies they're they're kind of kind of becoming like a like the version of an imf or something from mission impossible (laughs) where it's like sometimes they're evil sometimes they're good like there's a lot of history there we can talk about it but you know maybe we shouldn't yeah um so this movie does feature some international travel uh (laughs) first of all Going to the Vatican is international travel, technically. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Uh, which I think is bullshit. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. guess it's, I guess like if, if technically it's okay, but fuck that. It's yeah. A, it's a building. It counts, but it shouldn't. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's like, oh, my house is international travel. Yeah. Um, but the most notable international travel in this movie is a pretty wackadoodle, and it, they kind of just gloss over it. <laughs> so uh, Russell Crowe goes from Rome to a place called. Castile, Spain in the movie, which I looked up on a map. I couldn't find it. It's probably like a village or something, or maybe it doesn't exist. Sure. Um, so, But I don't know if you've seen a map. <laughs> um, and there's Rome. There's Rome, yeah. which is in the middle of Italy. Yeah. And then uh, Spain, which is like <laughs> on the other end of Europe. <laughs> and uh, according to Google Maps, if you drive there in a car nowadays, it takes 14 hours. Oh, wow. 14-hour drive. Uh Russell Crowe takes it on a scooter, on the scooter. <laughs> so, <laughs> six hours. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, like, this has to be a much longer trip, yes. right? Yeah. This is, is this a multiple-day trip? Did he drive straight through? Because, like, it was daytime when he left, and it was daytime when he got there. So, like, was he driving for 24 more straight hours? Uh, what was that trip like? Rob, the man exercises <laughs> demons. He performs miracles. Give him some credit. Maybe he knows a shortcut or he has some power. Listen, I'm not saying it didn't happen. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I want to see that movie. Okay, yeah. I, 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 like, I kind of want to – or, like, the Netflix limited series, like, mm-hmm. Fa- Father of Morth, like, road In trip. transit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because, like, <laughs> that is, like, some serious international travel. You have to drive completely through France. <laughs> right, right. <Which laughs> On a miserable. scooter. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, the international travel in this movie is, like, I mean, there's some really interesting shit there, and we get none of it. We just see, like, oh, he went from he went from Italy to Spain. We're like, yeah, but the, what's, what went on in between? Well, you know he performed some exorcisms in on the way. Yeah. I mean, on <laughs> thousands of exorcisms. Thousands of them, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of this movie. Maybe not as big of a fan as you are, uh, but it, it, it's, it's, got, it's good for some laughs. It's good for some thrills. 
it's a it gets the job done. Um, I think maybe one day it'll be a four star movie, but for for me right now, it's a three star movie, hmm. a pretty solid three star movie. Okay. Um, lots of Russell Crowe. <laughs> yeah, Russell Crowe being as as wacky as you. I mean, we we've, we've talked wacky Russell Crowe on on this mm-hmm. podcast before. And I, I I feel like he's like, oh, you thought that was the only version of Wacky that I had? Let me show you this. <laughs> <laughs> so this uh this this might surprise you. This has a two point six on Letterboxd. What the fuck? Two point six, which right, I you thank know. goodness for the staff recommendation show. Yeah. We're here to tell you it's better than that. It is. Um twenty seven percent of people agree with me that it's a three star movie. Okay. Uh, my feelings are summed up pretty well by Letterboxd user middle aged genre th- enthusiast. <laughs> <laughs> um and in this portion of their extended three star review, they said Large Russ is simply too too cute. <laughs> Scooting around on his Vespa to old Faith No More tunes and goofing about in satanic catacombs to not fall in love with this silly thing by the end, which I completely agree with. And I'm so glad that we have a name for late period Russell Crowe, <laughs> yeah. Large Russ. Large Russ. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm yeah. exercising this up to the staff recommendation shelf this week for international travel. Fuck yeah. I, I, you know, I was super skeptical because – I, I, as a fan of the genre, yeah, I you know when exorcism movies come out, they, they, I I pay hardly any attention to them. It's just like you've seen them one, you've seen them all. Uh, but this you uh, need that large rust energy. You do need that large rust energy. And I read enough reviews on various forums to suggest that this is worth a watch. Yeah, and then I saw it, and it's it was just a blast. Yeah. I, I I was. Totally, it, it almost reminds me of like what, what were those movies with Christopher Walken, The Prophecy? Yes, where it's like, oh, well, that that sounds like an inter- interesting premise. And you're like, well, what if Christopher Walken was in it? You're like, oh, okay, I'm <laughs> right, in. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Same Sorry, idea. Yeah. It's like, there, like even if it's like, even if there's parts of it you don't like, there's like, there's no way you get to the end of this, and you're just like, that wasn't worth it. I mean, Large Russ, any moment he's on screen, he's he's stealing the scene. Yeah, so Large Russ, yeah, gotta love it. <laughs> All right, for my second pick. I'm going to the Don't Forget to Pack Your Bonsai Tree section of the store. This is from 1986. And my pick is Karate Kid Part 2. The deuce. The deuce. The number two. Back of the box synopsis. After discovering that his father is at death's door, Mr. Miyagi sets out to Japan to see him with Daniel. Upon arriving, Miyagi must confront an old rival. Meanwhile, Daniel encounters a new love and some new enemies. Now, far away from the tournaments, the cheering crowds, and the safety of home, Daniel will face his greatest challenge ever when teacher becomes student and the price of honor is life itself. Amazing. <laughs> uh, tagline. This time the combat, is, the combat is real. Bad tagline. Yeah. Yeah, that's not uh, – it was like you're saying it wasn't real the first time, right? Yeah, it was very real. How dare you? The leg was swept. Yeah, there was some serious injuries happening. Indeed. So, um, the international traveling that occurs here is uh, from America to Japan, specifically Okinawa. Now, I grew up with the Karate Kid movies. Uh, my brother and I watched the first two of them incessantly. We'd reenact the fights from the tournaments. I remember asking for a bonsai tree for Christmas one year. Really? Uh, spoiler alert, I never <laughs> got one. <laughs> it's not too late. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, but um, I'll put it on the list. I'll for talk to your wife. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this franchise, for one reason or another, was in constant rotation in my house when I was young. So as a result, I kind of think of the first two films as one complete story, which, you know, it just so happens the first, the second film picks up minutes after the first film ends. Yeah, I so, didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. Per- I'd never seen this. I was not, I didn't grow up with, in a Karate Kid household. Interesting. I had seen the first one a few times before. I'd never seen the second one. Oh, wow. And I, I didn't realize it was just like an, you know, an instantaneous sequel. Well, they actually shot, so... Yeah, part two literally picks up right after the tournament ends like, in part one. They actually showed the end of the first movie in, right. in the second one. Yeah, and that scene where there's a confrontation uh, out in the parking lot was actually shot 
for the first movie, but they decided yeah. not to include it. This is a Back to the Future situation. They did the same thing. Yes, yes. Um, so, yeah, what we, uh, yeah, like I said, it feels like one big story to me, but what we get here is a movie that takes Daniel and Miyagi to the other side of the globe. As the back of the box indicates, the two travel to Okinawa. Miyagi's father is dying. Daniel chooses to accompany his mentor. And, uh, yeah, this movie not shot on location. Here, the Hawaiian island of Oahu is uh, shot to represent Okinawa. Uh, and it's a pretty fine stand-in. I wish they would have gone to Japan. Me too. I was like, kind of like – I was like, man, this is cool that they went to Japan. I didn't realize they, did, they didn't. <laughs> they didn't. Yeah, yeah. So even though it's – But they fooled me. They, yeah, well – it, it, felt, it, it felt real. The magic of movie making. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, work on this film started 10 days after the original hit theaters. Uh, so they, they knew they had a hit with the first movie, and they were like, let's get back to it. Um, Good work. This actually ended up earning more at the box office than the first movie, which blew my mind. I think that happens a lot with sequels. Yeah. Yeah. This came out only two years after the first one. Um, what's kind of remarkable is that it made more in spite of there being – a free nationwide screening of this film on July 4th, 1986. Brilliant. Isn't that? Why why doesn't that happen anymore? I don't know. But yeah, it's uh, what a great idea. Bring back the movies. (laughs) At least the Karate Kid. Yeah. (laughs) So why did I choose this? Um, As it relates to our theme, most of this movie takes place in Okinawa, but it's not really a fish out of water story. And this is where Miyagi is from. He knows the place. He knows the people, knows the culture. Daniel, accompanying him, is not really out of place. He's there to accompany his mentor, and he does a good job fitting in. I feel like this is a more mature entry into the Karate Kid saga than the first movie. It's more Mr. Miyagi's story, which it really is. I appreciate. I, I always felt like... His character is more fascinating, especially as an adult. When I yeah. when I was young, I related to Daniel LaRusso. It's like, ah, this kid's out of place. And Let's he, face it. Teenagers are boring. Teenagers are boring, yeah. Miyagi, however. Yeah. Fucking interesting guy. He's fucking awesome. Yeah, he is awesome. He's so fucking awesome in this. Yeah, and so we get to, we get to go to his hometown, learn more about the guy that taught Daniel LaRusso. Um, but, you know, to speak a little bit about Daniel, uh, I also think that he is – far less of a douchebag in this film. Uh, yeah. In the first movie, he's cocky. He's a bit of an asshole. Well, he's uh, acting out because he's the new kid in town. He's got to yeah. protect himself. Yeah. But I th- also think he's like kind of a uh, – yeah, it's just not likable. Like if yeah. I imagine myself living in that town and, and deciding, do I want to be friends with the new kid? If he's the new kid, I don't know that I do. <laughs> Probably true. Right. It's but, tough being the new kid. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. Uh, yeah, so here LaRusso isn't quite as annoying. You're kind of rooting for him. Um, but there's some there's some pretty compelling themes at play in the sequel compared to the original. So this is this is a story about honor and loyalty, friendship and love, mourning yeah. and loss. And uh, for a sequel from the 80s, I think that it's impressive that this isn't just a retelling of the first movie in a new setting. It could have easily been that. That's almost always what they were. Exactly. Yeah. And this this takes a swing. This feels akin to your Temple of Doom, which is like, all right, we're, we're, we're not afraid to do something different with our second movie. Um, I also have to mention we get an absolute banger of a ballad that highlights the soundtrack, Peter Cetera's Glory of Love, <laughs> which to this day is fucking, yeah. it's a stone cold classic. Yeah. It's up there with the uh, the Robin Hood song. <laughs> it is. You know? I might choose it over that. Is I don't there... think I would, but it's a good, I mean, it's a good one. <laughs> so this, uh, Glory of Love was originally written for Rocky IV. Oh, wow. And Didn't they just get rid of it? Studios were like, nah. <laughs> not, not, like nobody to get more Frank Stallone songs on the soundtrack. <laughs> yeah, soundtrack. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it went. It ended up with Karate Kid Part Two, and it's a much better fit for this. Uh, yeah. I Rocky I, Four is barely a movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is barely a movie. Um, and yeah, I think you know, Glory of Love. Just those three words, I think, encapsulate 
more of what's going on in Karate Kid Part 2 mm-hmm. than at all what's happening in Rocky <laughs> 4. <laughs> For sure. Uh, this average is a 3.1 on Letterboxd. I gave it four stars. 14% of Letterboxd reviewers agree with me. Uh, one review that I loved from Letterboxd was from Rib, who said, the best film, where the last line is, honk. <laughs> <laughs> I got to know, yeah, yeah. this is your first time with it. How yeah. did you feel compared to your memory or your relationship with the first movie? It's a classic. Yeah? Yeah, this this movie is great. Okay, I, I like it better than the first Karate Kid. Yes. Um, I actually, I mean, strangely, having said that I, like, I wasn't that familiar with the Karate Kid universe, um, I'm a huge Cobra Kai fan. Oh, okay. oh um, yeah, yeah. So, like, I knew the first movie. I've watched all all of Cobra Kai. Yeah, I haven't seen any of the other movies, um, but a lot of a lot of Cobra Kai makes more sense now because <laughs> a lot of these characters come back, like a, and a lot of it comes from the second movie. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay, right. so I'm not as familiar with Cobra Kai. I've I heard mean, that if it's you phenomenal. like Karate Kid, you have to go to okay. Cobra Kai. All right, one hundred percent. All right, so you're telling our our listeners that if they're even interested in Cobra Kai or if they've watched it, yeah. they need they need to have this on their list. I'm saying Karate Kid Part Two is an incredible movie. Oh, good. Yeah. What, what what would your star rating be? I get it four stars. We're yeah. in agreement. Yeah, I, and, I mean, it may maybe it's a five star movie. Yeah, I don't get five stars yeah. first, oh, first time first I watch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It usually takes <laughs> I let something sit for a couple of years before I make that determination. But yeah, good. it's an absolute easy four star movie. Yeah, um, it's great. It's definitely better than the first one. Mr. Miyagi's the fucking man. He is He's so great. I'd love to have him teach me some stuff. Um, all right. Well, I guess I'm going to take us to uh, the year before Karate Kid Part Two, a different style of karate. Oh, indeed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm choosing the movie Jim Kata. Oh boy, Jim Kata. This is in the fitness fusion <laughs> section of the store. Are there aerobics videos in that section? <laughs> uh, well, aerobics mixed with. Something else. <laughs> karate. Right. karate. Right. Cooking. <laughs> Here's the back of the box. U.S. agents send a gymnastic martial artist to secure a missile base in the savage country of Parmistan. <laughs> this is maybe one of the best taglines I've ever seen. The skill of gymnastics. The kill of karate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, how wow. many pluses can you put after an A? That it doesn't get better than that. <sighs> <laughs> that's that's amazing. It's an amazing tagline. This is one of those movies that probably most people don't know exists. Um, I didn't. So, <laughs> how in the world did I <laughs> did I choose this for the shelf? Um, this has been this has been in the store for years. It's been sitting there um, somehow. It was just off my radar for so long. I, I, I – for the longest time, ago, I knew of it. I knew it existed, but I wasn't sure why and I wasn't exactly sure what it was. And then I would say like maybe f- three four years ago, I decided to revisit early episodes of Mystery Science Theater. <laughs> okay. I started watching like the, the Joel years. So like seasons one through four, maybe one through five. And it turns out that they reference Jim Cotta – Constantly, <laughs> <laughs> and just usually just a general exclamation of Jim Cotta, <laughs> and just those jokes. I mean, they they burrowed themselves inside of me, and I didn't I didn't know the context at all, like zero percent. Um, but it stuck with me all these years. Okay, and then just being online the last couple of years, Letterbox especially, uh, film critic Matt Singer. Uh, around around maybe three or four years ago, ha- posted on Letterbox uh, that this was a five star movie for him, <laughs> and I was like, I've heard of that. Uh, this some of this this is all stuff coming together, but I've definitely never seen it. So I was like, well, I got to check it out. So yeah. I, I finally tracked it down. The plot of this movie is so outlandish and preposterous that it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. We could unpack it for hours. <laughs> Um, we we might start an offshoot podcast just about this the plot of this movie. There's a lot to talk about. There's a lot Rob. to talk about. <laughs> but it boils down to this: Kurt Thomas, who is a real life U.S. gymnast, uh, he was he did win some world championships, uh, whatever that means uh, in gymnastics. Wait, this is the real. So Kurt Thomas is a, is the, the actor. guy in the movie is a U.S. gymnast. Okay. Um, in fact, he he was 
he has some moves named after him. He has a pommel horse move that's named after him that's still considered like very difficult. According to Wikipedia, you know, like, you know, back in the day, they're like, yeah, we do this. Like, it's hard. And then like 20 years later, they're like some, you know, some kid is like, no, it's not. You is, know? It, is it a move that involves uh, kicking some crazy villagers <laughs> in the face while he's I, spinning around I on a pommel I have horse? to assume he was using <laughs> that move. But like, yeah. he was like, he was like a serious U.S. gymnast. And I guess he was in the, he was, he was like supposed to win a bunch of gold medals or something the year that the U.S. Uh, boycotted the Olympics. So gotcha. he was like considered like. A very good gymnast. And somebody, I guess, was like, I can put him in a movie. (laughs) Uh, So the mission is he's like he's like recruited by the SIA, which is kind of the CIA, but not really. Right. Um, The mission is to go into this country of Parmistan uh, so that he can ask the king of Parmistan for a favor. Except (laughs) that the only way into Parmistan is to play the game. Yeah, the, the the game. Which is essentially a long-form obstacle course, uh, except that you have to, like, dodge arrows that people are shooting at you. Life or death swords. obstacle course, yeah. yeah. Uh, the catch of this obstacle course is that nobody's ever completed it <laughs> <laughs> in 900 years. Right. Nobody's ever gotten through it, which means nobody's ever entered the country of Parmistan in the last 900 years. Yeah. So I guess... Nobody ever thought to send a gymnast before because the people who coming up, people who say, who and who can, would Rob who concoct this plan, are like one hundred percent confident that this plan will work. They're like, we'll just get this guy who's literally walking off the floor of the Olympics, yeah. And they're like, hey, come over here. Like they push away the We're groupies. Talk to you about they're like, get away, ladies. Uh, <laughs> hey, do you want to go to this? <laughs> this country you've never heard of and compete in a game that you'll die die at and nobody's ever done it. He's like, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, Sign me up. yeah, I'm going to I'm going to do that. <laughs> I'm ready. So once he completes the game, <laughs> he's able to ask the king if the United States can keep a satellite station in Parmistan, because that's the best place to put a satellite station. Is this coming together for you? I mean, what you're saying is accurate. I I can't say that it's it's coming together. And the way that – in that way, the the Star Wars satellite defense system will work way better. Wow. But if we don't, the Russians will come in and they'll have a satellite station. Well, we know that they have gymnasts. Yeah, then we'll lose the Cold War (laughs) because they don't know Ramius is giving us the sub. (laughs) Uh, So there's a lot riding on this. There's a lot riding on this. Plus the guy's dad is also in Parmistan apparently too for – they don't really say why. But – yeah. And then he falls in love with the Parmistanian princess who uh, is speechless for the first half of the movie because she doesn't feel like talking. And then the second and half of the talks. movie, she just talks. <laughs> um, so why are there so many people trying to get into Parmistan, I wonder? Because it's certain death. We, we acknowledge it's certain death. Nobody in 900 years has gotten into this country. It's a long time. Because first of all, the obstacle course is impossible. Right. And also, they cheat to make sure nobody wins. Right. The the, the deck is stacked. Yeah. <laughs> um, so why are people trying to get in? I guess maybe because, I don't know, maybe they're in a really bad situation. They're like, this is better if I yeah. do it this way. And like, I, I want to ask a favor. If I get through, I can like at least ask for something good. Yeah. Um, but also, I had to ask, why, why are they running it like a race? <laughs> like, when they start... <laughs> Everyone's like pushing everyone out of the way and they're running like they have to get to the finish line. But like nobody's ever finished. You could walk backwards to the finish line. If you make it all the way, you win. It doesn't matter. Like there's no race. No hurry. No race. Yeah. Um, But yeah, so they still seem to have a handful of people a day that attempt to get into this country. Yeah. uh, And do the game. Um, And uh, I'm sure you disagree with me on this, but I think the action is (laughs) fairly decent. I think it's good. Well, I do disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think the mixture of gymnastics and karate works. I mean, not like – it's not like John Wick 4. No. But um, I think it like – it's fun to watch. Well, this movie is fun to watch. I don't know that it's because of the if, – if for me, it is not because of the action. There's other stuff. I wouldn't say it's just because in. of the action. But yeah, yeah. I think, the, I think the, the action is fun. I think it's – I will say it's choreographed. Like it's choreographed it like a like a gymnastics routine, and um, you know, so it's not believable as a fight, but it to me it's fun to watch. It's I, like watching a, a, a capoeira uh, 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 
demonstration or something. Yeah. Now, I my feeling was I'm just watching a man uh, do a floor routine before uh, cracking a bottle over somebody's head or yeah. or giving him a kick to the stomach or something. So yeah. that sounds all, great. <laughs> all of the all of the gymnastics felt just like this flamboyant addition to fighting. That yeah, uh, yeah I. For me, it did not work. But that that's <laughs> not that definitely say, worked for me. That's not to say that the movie wasn't entertaining. There were some things that I really enjoyed about this, but like, like what? Well, I loved. I, so, I'll be honest. For the first uh, hour or so of this movie, I was waiting for it to be done. <laughs> for, for it to be done, and then he gets to the village. The crazy town. The crazy town. And it is crazy. And it's, the last the last act of this movie is fucking bananas. It is bananas. It it it, it became a bit of a horror movie when yeah. he gets to that village. It reminded me distinctly of a Resident Evil video game where you're literally running from these zombies yeah, and yeah. and these crazy villagers. You don't know why they're crazy, but uh, they're chasing this guy down. There's some haunting stuff happening in this village. I mean, some of the crazy people start just, like, making animal noises. Yes. Which yes. is super scary. Yeah. When when people are doing things that that uh, make absolutely no sense yeah. and it's not explained to you why they're, why they're behaving that way – I I find that frightening. It's and also it's also inept in a hilarious way. Like the like the whole yes. movie is inept in a hilarious way. Um, but also like it, like things like the in Crazy Town. Like there's a, just a pommel horse in the town in like <laughs> right, Crazy right, Town right, Square. Right, right. It's like all yeah. right. And so this he's just gonna do like pommel horse movies. It's like why is that there? Yeah. And there's like parallel bars and like the alleyways and the streets and stuff. Um, so yeah, it does. It definitely takes a turn. It definitely takes a turn. It does. And, and I was surprised how long. We spend in that village because yeah. that's like practically an act of the movie, and deservingly so. Yeah. It's, it's entertaining. It's yeah. different. I, I like seeing off-brand Luke Skywalker, you know, doing his gymnastics and and uh, knocking these villagers out for that section of the film. But um, yeah, the, it took it. It was it was a bit of an endurance test to get there for me. I think uh, I think it's definitely one of those movies. It's like a yeah, it's like a flavor you like, you know. Um, I think this is <laughs> this is a late this is a midnight movie. Great way to put it. You know, uh, have some booze drinks in you. Have some booze drinks. Um, I think it's just like a it's a strange '80s action movie artifact. I mean, the budget had to be close to a thousand dollars. I don't know what it was, <laughs> right. but like yeah. I mean, it's but yeah. like to me, it's compelling in in that way that I enjoy the the low budget B movie way. Um, it's kind of a movie that grows on you the more you you see it in a way that like one day I can I can see this being a five star movie for me if if I watch it with the right people and okay. I am in the right state of mind. Um, as it is now, I recently bumped it up to four stars. I've seen this movie several times. Oh wow. Okay. Uh, so eight percent of letterbox <laughs> users agree with me that it's a four star movie. It's rated at two point seven overall. Okay. Which I actually like. I agree with that in the sense that I think, and I don't want it to be. It's not a movie I expect to be high. You know, it's a movie that, like, yes, I, to me, it's a four or five star movie. But like, be, only because it's a two something star movie. Um, but that just kind of works for me. So, do you feel like it's probably a two point seven star movie for most people, and for for them? They're right in that assessment, but for a select few people who appreciate uh, a certain brand of, of off, karate, off brand <laughs> karate cinema, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Because if it was if it was a movie that had a three point eight, it wouldn't be that. Because yeah. people don't like that kind of stuff. Right, Not right, enough right. people like that kind of stuff. It's like if uh, a trashy exorcism movie, like it's never going to be four point one stars on Letterbox, no. and it shouldn't be. No. I agree. Then it wouldn't be a trashy exorcism movie, you know? Um, So the uh, Letterbox user, the Dion, (laughs) the Dionysiac (laughs) (laughs) underscored the the true significance of Jim Cotta in their four-star review. I can't believe that this is the only remaining living reminder of the great Parmistani culture and history. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, so if you like cheesy, low-budget 80s action movies, you you could do a lot worse than Jim Cotta. Um, 
in my opinion, you can't do too much better. Um, and I think it features probably the most convoluted international travel in movie history. And so I'm putting it on the rec- uh, the recommendation shelf this week. It is. Uh, I assume you're saying it's convoluted because uh, Parmesan is not a real place. The travel just to get to the border is almost impossible. And then once you get there, you have to go through an impossible obstacle course to make it through. So like it's Design literally – like no one's done it in 900 years. And it's just a very convoluted process. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Well, uh, interesting pick. I'm glad I saw it. And when you when you gave me the premise to this movie, I was my curiosity was peaked, <laughs> and I was not prepared for what I got. Uh, but I'm not sure that the movie totally understood the premise of this movie. <laughs> right. It's based on a book, if you can believe that. It's based on a book by a former like intelligence officer or something. Oh wow! And what it seems like is that the people who made the movie read the book and didn't understand the plot. And they're like, eh, we'll still write the script. <laughs> we'll, we'll try it anyway. Well, uh, what an experience. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Cotta. Jim Cotta. Jim Cotta, everybody. We'll find third choice. I'm going to round things out with my final pick. And this is uh, another new release. Comes from 2023. The uh, from the don't forget to pack your bucket hat section of the store, which is different than the bonsai tree section of the store. Uh, and this is the killer. Back of the box synopsis here. After a fateful near miss, an assassin battles his employers and himself on an international manhunt he insists isn't personal. Tagline execution is everything, which I like. That's a good one. Yeah. Especially having seen the movie and knowing the characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I Plus see the play double entendre is yeah. always good on the tagline. For sure. So international traveling that takes place here, we start in Paris. We then head to the Dominican Republic, then to New Orleans, then to Florida, which is which might as well be its own country. <laughs> yeah, really. And then uh, we round things out with uh, we're going up to New York and Chicago. So uh, three countries total. Uh, you know, assuming Florida is part of the United States. But, yeah, a lot of uh, jet setting mm-hmm. involved in the killer. And I feel bad for for choosing this because I know that we planned on talking about this as its own devoted mini episode. And uh, and that didn't happen, but uh, mostly because I was slacking on watching <laughs> this. I finally got around to it, and it, yep. it fit this theme perfectly for me. So. There is international travel. Yes. And it's my second Hitman-related movie for tonight. This is directed by David Fincher, written by Andrew Kevin Walker, who, uh, of course, worked on Seven with David Fincher. He got he was uncredited for his script work on The Game and Fight Club, yeah. but uh, present there as well. So a frequent collaborator with, with Fincher. This is apparently based on the graphic novel series by uh, the author Alexis Matz Nolan, apparently Fincher's first comic adaptation as well. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we get we get some more return familiar faces or characters in this in terms of the production uh, when it comes to Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, who have uh, who are now frequent collaborators with with Fincher. Uh, on the score side. And plus a lot of soundtrack as well. Yes. A lot of soundtrack here. We get a ton of the Smiths. Yes. <laughs> Exclusively the Smiths in yes. terms of soundtrack, which I think is great. It came from the notion of uh, – I think Fincher was was asking a question, um, you know, what would it be like if, if Johnny Marr was my meditation as a character yeah. in, in a movie? And – uh, and that led to, yeah, we're just going to lean into this guy's going to listen to the Smiths anytime he's listening to anything. <laughs> but also, I think when you watch when when you watch a movie like this, you want to you want to think that like, oh, this character has decided he's listening to the Smiths anytime he's doing this this job because like that puts him in a state of mind and X, Y, and Z. But uh, also, it's just like no. What people do is like sometimes they just get in moods and like <laughs> yeah. this month is like I'm listening to the Smiths all all month. And right. then like then you're like I'm sick of this. And then you move on to something else. Right. Um, and and I think Fincher was just like, well, you know, this month like this is what he's into. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. this is the kind of mood he's in, or like the music's putting him in the mood. It, yes, indeed. And it's funny because they they explored a version of the soundtrack that had like the Smiths, Joy Division, a bunch of like goth rock, mm-hmm. and 
Trent Reznor was actually the one that was like, nah, it needs to be the Smiths the whole time. <laughs> that's, and, which is also hilarious. Yes. <laughs> that's fucking hilarious. Yes. Uh, so um, our hitman is played by Michael Fassbender. We also get Arliss Howard, Chris Par- or Charles Parnell, Sayla Baker, Tilda Swinton. Uh, she's really the only other A-list actor here, which I think is great because – this is this is all about Fastbender's character, yeah. and you don't really want to have another big star competing with him. And uh, you know, when Tilda Swinton shows up, she's somewhat his equal, and so it makes sense for her to be recognizable. But um, this is all about Fastbender and uh, and and how he embodies this uh, this role of, I mean, of a hitman, or it's all about David Fincher. Or it's all about David Fincher. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Brad Pitt was originally considered, but Fassbender, I think, definitely the better choice. Uh, incidentally, the typeface for the chapter titles, this movie's divided into chapter titles or chapters, and the, the, the typography is the same that is used in the Hitman series of video games. Oh, cool. Yeah, which uh, obviously intentional and uh, and yeah. I know that we're both – wary of when narration is used to drive a film along. But I think that it works here because it's more of an inner monologue than it is. It's not a crutch in yeah. any way. It is not pushing the story along. No. Well, because he's by himself all the time. He's a he's a hitman who just is, a, is doing a solo mission and he's alone a lot of the time. And it yeah. made me think that like, oh, like when you're by yourself – your inner monologue turns into a manifesto without even trying. It just yes. becomes one, you know? Yes. And, and also, like, a lot of the movie is just, like, I think a lot of the, the takes on this movie was, like, oh, like, he set up all these rules for himself, and now he's, like, breaking all the rules in real time. Um, because, like, he keeps saying, like, you got to do this, you got to do this, and then he does the opposite in real life. Right. I don't think this is, like, his manifesto. I think this is just, like, his inner his inner thoughts, and, like, yeah. I think it's just, like, the way he's thinking and like you have to – I don't know. I think the way Fincher is presenting it is like, no, sometimes your mind just does this. Like it just gets into these, these, these spirals. And you need, you need that. You need, you need to hear something because we have to wait yeah. 27 minutes before dialogue is exchanged between two characters in this movie. So for that first half hour, you're just alone with Fassbender. And mm-hmm. and so all of what we're hearing is is helping to develop his character and shape our perception of who this guy is. So it's essential. Um, Fincher is on record having said, I love the idea of Charles Bronson – of a Charles Bronson character who's maybe – a misdiagnosed adult autistic. And before 2023, I'm not sure anybody would have gone, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> <Yeah>. But <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, that does make yeah, sense. Yeah. And but it, it it absolutely fits. So why did I choose this? This is my one movie where international travel seems to make the main character who he is. You know, he's experienced, smart, confident, cultured, calm. And you never question that he's a man who's been around the world, and and he clearly is that guy. It, it feels like the tra- the work that he's done, the traveling that he's done, has crafted him into this guy. I, well, this I feel like he's completely unfazed by international travel oh, in the sense 100%. that like he could be anywhere because because like he's in Paris and he's eating McDonald's. You know, mm-hmm. like, he's like I don't and I don't care where I am. I I, I do this. This is the opposite of in Bruges in the sense that yeah. those guys are like, I'm going to ride around on a boat and take in the, the bell tower. They're in the thick of it. Yeah. And and he is like, could not give He's like, two McDonald's, fucks. motherfucker. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, Fincher, we're big fans of Fincher. I think he, he does a fantastic job with this. Um, I think he does everything he knows how to do very well in this in, in this case. I don't, it's not his best movie. But it's one where he seems like a perennial all-star stepping into a Little League game to just, mm-hmm. like, smoke some kids. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, it's like, uh, I, you know, this is this movie is about is about making movies in a way because, yeah. you know, you, you can you lay you have the best laid plans. You know, every killer has a code. Every every director is like, all right, they always – I mean, anytime you go into any project, whether you're a director or whatever, you're like, all right, well, all the mistakes I made last time, 
these are the, the I'm going to go like, I'm really going to like do it by the book this time, exactly how I want to do it. Uh, but then when you're in the thick of it, you need to deal with what you're dealing with. And it doesn't matter what your fucking rules were before. Yeah. If you're making a movie and it's costing $100,000 a day just to keep the lights on, you got to make a fucking decision, <laughs> yeah. you know? And yeah. like, and also when you're making a movie, a big, a big budget movie, if you miss once, you're probably fired forever. Like, you, oh, yeah. you know? Um, and Fincher has that experience given he that he was He's on Alien 3. One and... of the few that could like Recover. live through that. Yeah. Uh, maybe because everyone knew that like it wasn't his fault. Yeah. But like- he was a centimeter away from never having a career. Oh wow! Because of that, that puts this movie in context in a in a way that I hadn't even considered, and it makes me appreciate it more. It does feel like a bit of a commentary on his own career. Yeah, because when you're dealing with the high stakes like that, it, no matter what you're doing, if you're a, a, a film director that makes hundred million dollar movies, or if you're a the general in an army or whatever, like if you make one small mistake. That's the wrong mistake. You Harder. could, I mean, you, you, your career is over. Hard to recover from. You, you can't recover. You know? Yeah. I mean, he's such a deliberate director, famous for meticulous attention to detail. I think that comes through in spades here. Mm. This is also, in my opinion, one of his more fun movies. There, I, I actually, there, there's stuff that I laughed at here, and I'm not used to yeah, doing yeah. that with, uh, with a David Fincher movie. I mean, well, I mean... Fight Club's a comedy. Fight Club has some funny moments. I mean, I think I think he's I think Fincher's kind of fucked in the head. I think he oh, thinks all of his movies are sure. comedies. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> he probably thinks <laughs> Seven's probably a right. comedy on some level. Uh, well, that, that it's funny you say that. <laughs> that, that. That ties into my my re, uh, Letterbox review, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, I, as I said, I think Fassbender is perfect for this part. The rest of the casting is fine, but uh, yeah. I think everyone else is supposed to play second fiddle to to Fassbender here, um, and it's it's just a beautifully shot movie. The the fact that we're going to different parts of the country, I think, or different parts of the world, is what you expect from a movie where international travel is 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 involved. And in, you know, the locales are are certainly exotic. It almost feels like a subdued John Wick movie in the sense that you know yeah. we're, we're jet setting, we're going all over the place, but uh, in this case, it's a little dialed back from the neons and the you know craziness of, of a John Wick film. This gets a three point four on Letterboxd. I gave this four stars. Twenty nine percent of Letterboxd reviewers agree with me. Ella Kemp from Letterboxd uh, had a similar review as as I did, and she said. Imagine scrolling through Netflix and this being your first Fincher and then taking seven for a spin for a laugh. <laughs> yeah, it's, it would be, be rough. <laughs> it would be quite a departure, I think. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, Fincher's always great. I'm not, I still haven't decided exactly what this movie is. I'm still like letting it digest a little bit for me. Yeah, I, need to, I, I can't wait to watch it again. Yeah, and I, I want to give it a little bit of time before I do, but uh, but yeah, I I feel like there's a lot that I missed the first time around, and that's only because you're soaking so much in mm. uh, in every moment of this film. Well, Rob, passports are stamped, clothes are unpacked, souvenirs distributed, movies are chosen. We went international tonight and came back with six movies that took us abroad in all different directions. The international travels movie international travel movies that we chose are The Hunt for Red October, In Bruges, The Pope's Exorcist, Karate Kid Part Two, Jim Cotta, and The Killer. If you like websites, go to rewindvideopod.com where you can drop us a line, get on our mailing list, or find us on social media. Social media. We use the social medias. <laughs> like traveler's checks. Yeah. I'm on Letterbox. That's <laughs> that's the, the new generation of social meds. I like it. Well, next time, we are armed to the teeth with a theme devoted to weapons. I don't even know what I'm gonna pick for this, but I can't Slice wait to up. can't wait to choose something. Knives, <laughs> guns, yeah. wit. Gymnastics. Gymnastics. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, as usual, we will have six films to recommend. In the meantime, feel free to stop by the counter for a movie to watch, and we will see you next time. Be kind, recommend. Hail, Hail Satan. Satan.
This time we mean it. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Hail Satan.